So, just to remind you from Bob, what Bob said yesterday, or one aspect of it, um, this is a course, so you should certainly feel free to ask questions. Uh, I should say, this is, this, this is my comfort area. So this means I might go faster than appropriate, slow me down. That means that as we move into lectures later on this week, I'm getting out of my comfort area, so I'll be relying upon you for more assistance. But anyway, at the moment we're talking about the solar neighborhood. Um, this is roughly an outline of, of what we're going through today. Uh, if we don't get through it, then I'll stick it in there because I'm still not certain what I'm doing in one of the lectures, so if I can get extra stuff to put in there, that will be fine. Uh, so, I outline it. Give, give a rough idea of what the solar neighborhood looks like. I think it's always good to know where you are and what's around about you. And then talk a bit about some reference samples within the local volume. Then get on to the stellar mass function. I've worked in the stellar mass function for the last 30 years, so if I get over-enthusiastic there, then drag me back. But it is uh, one of the fundamental parameters uh, that you want to understand when you're looking at how a, a gas cloud turns itself into stars. And then I'll talk a bit about multiplicity and look at the low mass end um, to complement what Bob talked about yesterday. So this is a map of the, where we are, about 400 parsecs to a side. This is gas stuff. Uh, I, I, think, I mean, this is the, the nearest OB association is up here, the Scosan association. You can see it's somewhat distinct from the dark clouds. It's, it's typically, it, the age estimates for Scosan run from about 10 to 20 mega years. We'll come back to that later. Hyades, the nearest open cluster here. Pleiades down here, sitting uh, near the Taurus dark cloud. Um, these various bubbles around here are all presumably ex excavated by massive stars at some point in the history. Zooming in even closer, um, this is now something like, what about, yeah, about 100 parsecs per side. So we're sitting in here in a thing called the, the local fluff uh, in the local bubble, and again, the, the Hyades, a bunch of stars round about us. It's, we're in a fairly evacuated area of the, um, of the, of the galaxy. We're in an interarm region. And that obviously influences what stars we see round about us. What is the difference of density? Uh, I think that's maybe on the next, it's, it's maybe about a factor of 10. Actually, some numbers on the next slide. But, so within the local bubble, you're talking about 0.05 atoms per cc. Um, the local fluff, <laughs> which is what we're sitting in right here, is around about double that. It's probably about three or four times that when you're out, into, and then it, I mean, it gets to much higher densities, obviously, as you're getting into the star-forming regions. But these are, this is a fairly, even the, uh, the local fluff is um, a fairly low density around about us. We're in a fairly highly evacuated region. The local bubble, as I say, people have suggested that this uh, was formed by a supernova something like 10 or 20 million years ago. And there is some tie-in to something called the Pleiades B1 group, which may or may not exist. But obviously, uh, and that, whether that age ties in particularly well with the Pleiades age is, um, is also open to question. So nearby star clusters, Hyades, Pleiades, and Pricepi. Then the nearest star-forming region is the Taurus cloud. And the, real, the nearest dense star forming region going back is Rho Ophiuchus, which is where? Up in, nearest chameleon Rho Ophiuchus is up there, about 150, 160 parsecs away. So those are the kind of constraints that come in when we try and understand star forming regions. We're not sitting right next to one. 160 parsecs is still quite a distance to work with. Okay, so what we would like to do is to look locally, put together a representative sample that gives you an unbiased, as, as unbiased as possible, a representation of what the galactic disk is like. Um, you don't want to pick things based on intrinsic stellar properties, because whenever you pick things by color, or you pick things by metallicity, or you pick things by uh, I know, velocity, then you're probably going to pick out a biased sample the best way of picking a sample always is just to look in a volume. Just put down a set of, put down a fence and look at everything inside the fence. Uh, you have to put the fence big enough so you get a large enough sample. But you can't get too big because you want to look at everything. And the, the real constraint in looking at everything is luminosity. And we'll, we'll get onto that a little bit later. But one of the, the main area that I work in on is low mass stars, brown dwarfs. Those things are, are, aren't really detectable beyond about 20 parsecs. 
So that's the kind of limits that you're working on when you're trying to understand everything that's going on within the galactic disk. Um, you have to hope that the local sample is representative of the disk as a whole. And as I'll talk maybe more in the next lecture, there's actually good reason to think that we're not sampling stuff that was made locally and stayed locally. There's a fair amount of mixing within the galactic disk. So you're not just, uh, I, th I think it's later on, does it? Yeah, you look locally, but you think globally. Um, star clusters, of course, are another way of doing this. But that's Bob's problem. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, O stars, you can see all the way across the galaxy. There isn't really any kind of problem with finding an O star. There's a lot of problem trying to measure its properties because if it's way across the galaxy, you don't really know where exactly it is, and there could be interstellar material in between you and it. But luminosity is not an issue when it comes to finding O stars. M dwarfs, you're stuck with what you can see locally. Um, what you have to try and do is to connect these different samples, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to provide a cast iron definitive way of doing that. I'm merely going to indicate here that this is something that we need to think about. Uh, and since this is a course, we don't actually have to answer everything. But, but clearly, when you're looking at samples from very different parts of the galaxy, tying things together is an important issue that needs to be thought about all the time. And then we'll say something perhaps about exactly how well uh, local samples map the, glo the global characteristics. Okay, so the first thing you have to measure is the distance. And parallax is the fundamental way of measuring distance. Um, Hipparchus really revolutionized things when it came to understanding where stars were within the immediate solar neighborhood. But even Hipparchus really only gave you reliable parallaxes out to maybe 50 to 100 parsecs. I mean, beyond that, <coughs> you're starting to get, even with a milliarc second uncertainty, then you're talking about uh, sigma pi over pi of, of um, more than 10%. So that's when Luke's Kalker corrections come in and really start to bias things, and you really have to worry uh, about effects. So Hipparchus was great going out to 100 parsec. Gaia will definitely revolutionize this by taking a much larger slice of the galaxy. If you don't have trigonometric parallaxes, you have to go for the, uh, the poor person's version, which is photometric parallaxes, which work fairly well for stable hydrogen burning stars. They don't work terribly well for evolved stars, and they work really not at all for brown dwarfs, um, as we'll get on to a little later. Um, this, these are the typical diagrams. Well, maybe. So this is B minus V against absolute visual magnitude. This, hap this happens to be for a sample of um, stars with the Parkas data within 25 parsecs. The dotted line here indicates roughly where the completeness is. Um, evolved stars, uh, the width in the main sequence there is real. That's something that then factors into things like Malmquist bias corrections. If you take a particular color, you're not getting a spot on absolute magnitude. The dispersion is due to intrinsic differences within the stars. Part of it is due to youth, part of it is due to activity, part of it is due to metallicity variations you may or may not be able to see four little yellow dots down here. Those are the four subdwarf stars within 25 parsecs of the sun. This is why it's really difficult to do uh, kinematic, well, this is why we need Gaia to really understand the galactic halo. There's only four metal poor subdwarfs within 25 parsecs, that's it. Um, this is I minus J against absolute J magnitude. I think it could be absolute I. The resolution is such I can't even say. There's M dwarfs coming down here, and then L dwarfs and T dwarfs down at the bottom here. Um, this is just to give, this is absolute. So A stars are up here, absolute magnitude zero for all of this. Um, this is obviously a better, the longer lever arm you have in a color, the better chance you have to estimate an absolute magnitude because you've got, uh, you know, the, the slope is better with regard to the color. Here we're going from zero to four in I minus J. This is J minus K, which is absolutely useless for M dwarfs because they all have the same color, but it's really good for L dwarfs. You can see from these diagrams where my bias is. It's the low mass stars. There are absolutely no A stars on these diagrams. I mean, A stars and OB stars don't really exist as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, so you get a color, 
you go up there, you apply the appropriate uncertainty, you, you find a mean relation, and you estimate the, um, the absolute magnitude from the color, you estimate the distance, and then you allow for the intrinsic dispersions when it comes to doing the um, calculations. <laughs> yeah, and like it says here, don't smooth over kinks. There are features in the, in the diagrams that actually mean something. So just some local samples. Um, you, can, you have to work really locally, eight parsecs. That's the distance where we're complete. Going beyond eight parsecs, you start to lose stuff. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. 191 stars and brown dwarfs and 139 stellar systems. Another sample that um, uh, I've worked with is looking at the, the PMSU, Palomar, Michigan State University uh, M dwarf survey. That was looking at all M dwarfs within 25 parsecs. There's about 560 M, uh, main sequence stars and 448 systems. 20 parsec ultra cool. This is looking at the very lowest mass objects, late M, L, and T dwarfs. Um, this is complete out to 20 parsec. This is something we completed recently <coughs> using the two mass near infrared sky survey. Uh, the strangely named 2M second survey. This was from the second data release of the two mass survey. And this we used to search 40% of the sky for M and L dwarfs. Lots of different pieces putting together here. And finally, the, this is the, um, the sample that's contributing to this diagram here. Actually, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of things sitting here. These are stars that have, have bad uh, photometry from Hipparchus. So within, within 25 parsecs, there's 1,069 stars and 809 systems. Uh, FGK dwarfs down to absolute magnitude 8. Uh, 41 evolved stars, 4 halo subdwarfs. This, the, we'll talk a bit later, the 8 parsec sample is complete, I think, with regard to every hydrogen burning star, including binary systems. This is not complete with regard to binary systems. This I haven't updated. Uh, uh, Bob talked yesterday about the, um, the new um, binary survey on FGK stars. Those data aren't factored in here. Uh, Okay, so focusing down and on the immediate volume around where we live. There are seven brown dwarfs, two of which are isolated systems, five of which are companions. There's 12 white dwarfs, seven isolated. So these are the remnants of the massive stars, the, o, uh, the OB stars and the A stars. 172 stars, uh, 172 main sequence stars, that should be. Um, 92 isolated. 38 that are primaries, and 47 that are companions. So the first thing you can do is put all those numbers together, and you find that within the local volume, you know, Bob talked about, for the FGK stars, um, the multiplicity is about 50%. Within the local volume, the multiplicity is only 27%. 20, picking a system at random within eight, eight parsecs of the sun, there's a one in four chance you're going to find a multiple system. And that's because it's dominated, as we'll see later, by the lower mass stars. Space densities, overall, it's about 0.1. Uh, Sorry? Yeah? Does it include the spectroscopic uh, system? Or not? Yeah. Almost all of these systems have been surveyed. There's also, because they're so close, the, 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 the parameter space for purely spectroscopic uh, systems is much, much smaller than when you're looking far away. But yeah, all of the, uh, well, I, not all of them. The brown, some of the very low luminosity brown dwarfs have not, don't have um, high accuracy rate of velocity measurements. But for the, for the main sequence stars, they've all been done. Uh, so yeah, these are just numbers then. About, uh, there's about 0.1 stellar systems per cubic parsec in the, in, the, in the vicinity, which is about the same as the space density within an OB association. So is the sample complete? This is a little bugbear of mine. Todd Henry likes to plot up this diagram here, which is the cumulative number density as a function of distance from the sun. So just adding in systems one at a time. And if you fit a curve to the immediate, the five parsecs within, uh, the, basically the five parsec sample right next to the sun, you would say that we're missing an awful lot of sample stars. So this is what's observed. <coughs> This is what's predicted. He, for, uniform volume. for a uniform volume, right. I don't think that's the case. So this is, this is slightly complicated, but this is my attempt at doing the same thing. So this is the cumulative uh, 
density, or the, the, num the num well, number versus distance for stars and for stellar systems. And then this, this is plotting the running space density uh, going out from 0 to 10 parsecs. And you can see this is the curve running along here. There's a kind of bump in the density when you go out past 3.5 parsecs because there's about two or three systems in there. It reaches the plateau between 4 and 6 parsecs, and then it drops off. And this drop-off is what's claimed to be a deficit of systems um, out there at, between once you get beyond 6 parsecs, 5 or 6 parsecs. Well, you can look at what you can do is to take the, the distribution of stars as a function of absolute magnitude within 6 parsecs and do the same thing out to 8 parsecs and, in fact, do the same thing out to 20 parsecs. Take the difference and say which stars are missing. And that's what this plot on the right does. At the top here, this is the luminosity function against absolute J, I think it's absolute J magnitude. So G stars, early M, mid M, late M. Luminosity function for the six parsec sample, the eight parsec sample, and a 20 parsec sample. And then take the difference and you can find which stars are missing. For eight parsecs, the most of the missing stars are sitting in here at bright magnitudes. And it is just not reasonable that those stars are missing from an 8 parsec sample. These are things, these are early type M dwarfs that would be 10th to 12th magnitude. And we really know the sky pretty well at, at that level. If you look at the difference between the 6 parsec and 20 parsec sample, there's a big bump sitting out here corresponding to late type M dwarfs. And it's entirely reasonable that, that even going out to 20 parsecs, we're missing a lot of uh, the later type M dwarfs in that volume. But with eight parsecs, there really isn't any strong evidence that we're missing systems. So I think what we're seeing here, and actually what I've done here is these bars represent the sampling uncertainty for, uh, uh, there's only about 50, uh, 50 stellar systems going out to about five parsecs, then you've only got 140 or so going out to eight parsecs. If you think of this in terms of taking a volume and sticking it down at random, on the galactic disk, then I think it's reasonable to talk about Poisson sampling uncertainties there. Obviously, you're not talking about Poisson sampling uncertainties in terms of the, the, the stars that you can see. You see a star or you don't see a star. But in terms of the volume of space, then I think it's reasonable to say we're, just having, we're doing a random sampling from the galactic disk. So I think these kind of variations are, are typical of what you find in the interarm regions in the disk. So. That just, so this is why I think the local sample is representative um, or is, is pretty solid in terms of what's there. Neil, you said down to the 0.1 solar masses? Yeah. So M... That's M8, M9. M9. Yeah. I mean, I mean yes. We're, we're definitely, we're almost certainly incomplete for once you get below the hydrogen burning limit. But that's a different ballgame. So what we want to do is to take this sample and figure out the mass function. That's the fundamental quantity. Like I say, this describes how gas gets turned into stars, how a molecular cloud decides to redistribute its material and make stars. The way that we usually do that is that we measure a luminosity function and we take a mass luminosity relation and then transform the one into the other. Another thing that we want to look at is stellar multiplicity. We'll come on to that later. Stellar kinematics, um, I'll talk about that in the next lecture. And then the metallicity, metallicity distribution, which in some sense we'll be talking about mixing in this. Again, that I'll talk about in the, in the next lecture. But this is, you know, we've got a local sample. We think with it's representative. We can study those stars in detail. So we want to try and use those as, as, as um, markers for what the rest of the galaxy is doing. Okay, the luminosity function. More beautiful color diagrams. As I said, the solar neighborhoods, it's, the luminosity function is simply the number of stars per unit it's absolute visual magnitude here. It could be absolute J magnitude. It's per unit luminosity per cubic parsec. And this is what we have to work with here. So we don't have massive stars right next to the sun. We have the remnants. We have Sirius B. We have Procyon B. We have 40 Arrhydni C, I think it is. We have a lot of, we have a bunch of white dwarfs nearby that used to be massive stars, but they've all grown up. Uh, for, the, for the massive stars, we have to go to clusters and try and tie those on later. Um, so this is the luminosity function. And this is 
what I've called the Ann Elk luminosity function. Those who don't know Ann Elk, look it up with Ann Elk and a dinosaur. This is my luminosity function. It belongs to me. It is small at this end. It is big in the middle. And it is small at that end. <laughs> this will become apparent from Google. So you have A stars, F stars, G stars, K stars, and almost all of the stars near the sun are M dwarfs. 70% of the stars within the immediate solar neighborhood are M dwarfs. That's where all the action is. Forget about these bright things, that, the fluff that appears and disappears quickly. So the peak at MV of plus 12 corresponds to about a quarter of a solar mass. Um, looking down at the very low luminosity end, this is what we got from our, uh, our two mass survey for what we call ultra cool dwarfs. These are L dwarfs and T dwarfs. Um, these are typically objects that have masses really close to or below the hydrogen burning limit. So L dwarfs are the next spectral sequence after M. They, it's where dust starts to condense out in the atmosphere. You start to get really cool things like uh, pressure broadening of potassium lines to about 1,000 angstroms across. T dwarfs are what comes next when the atmosphere comes down to basically looking like Jupiter. You're, you're talking about things that are about 1,000 Kelvin, where the atmosphere and infrared is dominated by methane bands. This is where we really start to become incomplete because these are extremely low luminosities. And then this plot here is, this is plotting now as a, a spectral type logarithmic plot. The um, filled in bits here of the, uh, the, the shaded histogram is the contribution from secondaries, tertiaries, and so on in, in systems. But again, the peak is roughly sitting around about the mid-type M dwarfs. So we want to transform that to a mass function. That means you need a mass luminosity relation. And mass luminosity relations you get from binary stars. For the massive stars, it's typically eclipsing binaries. Um, once you get down to the fainter stars, you're talking more about astrometric binaries, where you have resolved systems and you're basically doing, uh, you're doing accurate astrometry <coughs> over periods of years to determine orbits. You determine the orbits, you can determine the mass. Um, and these various relations in here are, are the lines coming through the system are, are mean relations that have been fitted to, to the data. There are diff you can use different luminosities to estimate mass. Um, this, is for, this is comparing the absolute magnitude, the V magnitude absolute, uh, well, the mass luminosity for MV against mass and for MK against mass. What you can see is that going to the infrared buys you a lot in terms of accuracy in masses because the dispersion goes down. The infrared, you're sampling beyond the peak in the, uh, you're looking at the Rayleigh gene's tail, and it actually gives you a better leverage on the, what the true luminosity of the star is out there. There's there is still some real scatter. Um, these, this is, line here is a theoretical calculation uh, from models by Gilles Chabrier, and I think by um, Isabel Braff. Um, there are some points that stand off that line. That's telling you that you're not going to be spot on accurate with every object. There is a dispersion here due to the intrinsic properties of the star. But basically, this does give you a way of measuring the distance and the absolute magnitude of a star and then going to estimate its mass. So you do that. OK. Yeah, I guess I said that. that for high mass stars, um, yeah, Sirius is the most massive star locally. So we need to go to the young clusters to try and um, figure out how to tack on the high mass end of the relation here. This is the, what you get. And this, I, I, I like, um, like Bob, I've, I've stolen quite a number of plots from the uh, review article that our organizer was involved in by Sebastian, Covey, and uh, Meyer. This is the mass function then for a range of, this is for the field, and then for a range of clusters uh, looking at them together. Basically, what you find is that the mass function tends to be steep at the high mass end. It flattens out and turns over and probably goes down at the, uh, at the low mass end. I think I have other diagrams. What's my, what? Yeah. So what do you do about brown dwarfs? That was clever. I never started this. How much longer do I have? 25 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I think. Yep, yep. Um, you put down a stopwatch and then you don't start it. That's not much help. Anyway, so we're looking at, looking at brown dwarfs. The, the problem with brown dwarfs is that they cool rapidly with time. 
Um, these are cooling tracks, temperature against age for brown dwarfs ranging in mass. Well, these are stars up here. So this is about a 0.08 solar mass star that starts at uh, uh, 3,000 degrees, cools off after about, uh, this, is, this is age in, in logarith logarithmic age, so a billion years here, uh, 10, 100 million, 10 million, a million years. After a billion years, an M dwarf, is a, a, a point of 0.08 solar masses has basically settled onto the main sequence. It's stably burning hydrogen. If you go to lower mass objects, they don't ever manage to ignite hydrogen in the core. They don't ignite hydrogen, they don't have a stable source of energy, therefore they keep on cooling. And you'll see that they descend with increasing rapidity. The lower mass the object, this is 0.075 solar masses, down here you're at 0.03 solar masses. So after a billion years, a brown dwarf 0.03 solar masses or 30 Jupiter masses has cooled down to about 1,000 degrees. Uh, is it correspondingly, it's correspondingly difficult to try and estimate the number density of those objects because they're so, uh, so lumin such low luminosity. So you're dealing with this. This is what we can see. You see the young luminous brown dwarfs. This is what you have to try and estimate. Uh, I could call this the Titanic problem. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this is, this is something we, tr we try and do this by taking observations of nearby stars and, and fitting them against models. These are some predictions uh, taking different mass functions and predicting the luminosity that you take a mass function, you assume a star formation rate uh, in the galaxy, and then you predict the luminosity distribution of uh, stars, as a fun of brown dwarfs rather, as a function of absolute magnitude. These are the observations here. So these are the L dwarfs. Then you get into the T dwarf regime, and you can see that we're still have substantial uncertainties there. And this is, these are mass functions that are uh, power law mass functions, mass to the mi minus 1.1 or mass to the minus 0.5. We're still really working to try and distinguish between those two options down here. Um, this is something where going to young clusters can actually help you as well, which I think we'll maybe discuss a little bit later on. This is the mass function from the nearby, the local stars. The present day mass function, because um, that's one other thing that we need to factor into this, that for the present day mass function, you're just taking what you observe, transforming it to mass. And this is basically the same relation that was in, the, in Mike's plot. You have a fairly steep slope at the high mass end, and you have a fairly flat distribution. A flat distribution here is, is number goes as m to the minus one. So, the number is increasing as you get down from one solar mass down to a tenth of a solar mass. And then the brown dwarf regime is up at this end here. One other thing you need to take into account for, uh, in trying to estimate the initial mass function is that the present day mass function is what stars are around at the moment. Above about a solar mass, the typical star has a main sequence lifetime that's less than the age of the galaxy. Therefore, you're only getting the subset that formed within the main sequence lifetime. Uh, around about, what, 1.2, 1.3 solar masses, the main sequence lifetime is probably around about a billion years. The age of the galactic disk is about eight or nine billion years. So you need to correct the, the observed numbers for stars that were born and died. That's what then brings you down here to, to an estimate of the initial mass function, which again, it has the same form. And, and as we always do, we fit straight lines. We, we say this can be represented by two power laws. Is the next one? Yeah. And in fact, that's typically the way that, do I show that? Yeah. That's typically the way that the mass function has been represented. This is a plot again from the, the Bastian uh, et al. review paper, which takes, so this is the, the power law fit of a mass function as a function of stellar mass from a thousand, that's no. Yeah, one solar mass, 10 solar masses, 100 solar masses, I believe. And what you find is that the mass function appears steep for high mass stars and gradually declining as you get down to the lower mass stars. Actually, yeah, I probably... Mike, do you want to comment on that? No. Nope, good. Oh, there's a question, actually. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yep. So, uh, why don't you see the decrease for lower mass stars that seem by uh, studies like 
Cooper and Art Chappie. You mean the, the, tur the turn down at the faint end? Yeah. I think that's, uh, actually, I think that may be, that's actually more a matter of, again, how you represent the data. We're all, we're all starting with the same data set. And I think, actually, if, uh, let me go back here. This, this data set here doesn't go down to quite as low luminosities as, as, uh, as the Kraupa and, uh, uh, and the Chabrier set goes. Um, I th these, this is their representation. This, so this is what I showed. This is Kraupa's fit to the data. Um, these are Chabrier's fit to the data. We all basically have the same data, and we're actually all fitting different relations to them. And I think the important point to make here is these are all fitting relations. There's a log, you can fit it with a log normal, you can fit it with a power laws. Um, Kraupa's uh, match to the, uh, the mass function has a steep, I think, a, a power law slope round about Solpeter, which is uh, what, minus, minus 2.3 if you're doing it by m, then down to about 1, and then it turns over and, and goes down at the faint end. It's a three segment power law. There's no physics behind that. Chabrier uses something like a log normal, there's also no physics behind that. Um, I think there are. I think we know roughly what the mass function looks like. It's steep at one end. It, it, it flattens out round about um, uh, solar type stars down to M dwarfs, and it does turn down at the faint end. I think the turn down at the faint end comes more from looking at clusters like the Pleiades, young clusters where you can see the brown dwarfs better than looking in the solar neighbourhood. We know that we're incomplete for brown dwarfs in the solar neighbourhood. Uh, in clusters, you can actually be more complete. But all these different represent, these are all different representations of the data. They're not actually under, they're not giving you physical insight into why the mass function looks the way it does. So I don't think we actually agree on the data, and I think we're just fitting them with different mathematical formula. And my feeling is that until we actually understand what's causing the mass function to look the way it does, you can't really argue about the mathematical fitting afterwards. Did that make any sense? Or? Yeah. Mike? I completely agree, and I'll just add that the group of formalism is mostly fitting the same data Niels mentioned. Yeah. You can think of its extrapolation deep into the brown dwarf regime as a prediction, if you want to be generous of right. calling a fit to have a prediction or not. And then, as Neil said, it's clusters in young regions, and hopefully the new cool, ultra cool star IMFs that Neil and others are working on will test whether or not those. Yeah, I mean, we know the local density is down to here. Anything beyond that, you're extrapolating, and you deserve what you get. Um, looking at this, is, so this is now taking the, the this is actually taking a, 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 a Chabrier mass function, his his log normal fit, and comparing that against various uh, star clusters. In most cases, I would say that the agreement is is, is within the uncertainties. Um, most places that you look, the mass function doesn't seem to change, except in the Taurus dark cloud, which is the one place I think you can look. This is high mass, this is low mass. One solar mass, a tenth of a solar mass. Taurus seems to be producing less low mass stars than you would expect if it had a normal IMF. And I think that's, the, that's one of the few regions where we think that's going on. Um, I have to plug JWST. It's going to come after Gaia but it will be coming now. Did I have? Yeah, there we go. And it is going to be extremely effective for this kind of work. Uh, two instruments to think about. MIRI is a mid-infrared camera that's going to be able to, to really push down to very low luminosity limits. Neurospec is a multi-object spectrograph. After 2019 and onwards, we're going to be able to say an awful lot more about very low mass objects in the, uh, than we, we can say now because of JWST. So just don't let the cosmologists get all the time. Even the exoplanet guys, they're nice people, but they don't need all the time. So, how universal is the mass function? So there's, a, there's three examples I'm going to give of where, where there have been suggestions that the mass function is different somehow. One of them came up recently in doing microlensing work. So microlensing, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with. Microlensing, you're looking at some object moving in front of another object, and, and gravitational lensing leads to a change in brightness of the background object. You have the background source, you have the lens, the lens moves in front of the source and you see a characteristic uh, change in brightness. The length, the duration of the brightening 
depends on the relative motion between the background source and the foreground source. So typically, uh, the, the relative motion also depends upon the mass of the lens. A high mass lens will give you a long duration object, a long duration micro lensing blip. A low mass object gives you a short duration micro lensing blip. Now, um, and that's, that's, that's obvious, the, the, you're looking at the gravitational field and obviously a, a massive object has a, a larger gravitational field than a small object. Recently, the microlensing guys analyzed their data and looked, focused in on the short period um, events. Now, they're looking within the galactic plane, so you can assume that on average, everything is the same relative velocity. So in this case, the short period events should be referring to low mass objects, even down to planetary mass objects. And the long period events, and there's a few of them known, could be things like black holes. So looking at the number of short period events, they, they, they took a mass function and they predicted, and they took that from that mass function, they predicted what they would expect to see in terms of number of objects. And they found an excess of very short period events compared with what they had uh, expected from the mass function. So they are arguing that within the field that are actually, uh, once you get down to things around about a few Jupiter masses, there's actually a significant excess compared with extrapolating the, the mass function. They're saying that there's a, a turn up uh, at very low mass end. This could be, one thing that this could be would be planets in very wide orbits around about stars. That hasn't been quite taken into account. But this is one suggestion that the mass function changes a bit when you get down to very low masses. And it is certainly one of the few ways that we have of probing that kind of mass regime. Neil, yep. Says yes. Yeah, and this is this is uh, this is saying that there's a bump. So I think they took an M, uh, they took a decreasing mass function, uh, but it's getting down there into the like I said the, the the three to five Jupiter mass where nobody has really dared to extrapolate. So I, I think it's an interesting result that needs more work. This is, this is the, the, sorry, yes, this is the time, the characteristic time of the lensing event. So, this, so they have transformed the mass function onto uh, the time and then the number. So. Another area where there's been suggestions that the mass function is different is looking at these outer regions of, the ga of um, galaxies. Um, as I say, there's, there's, if you go out beyond the edge of the disk, there is some ultraviolet light. What there isn't is H alpha emission. Uh, that if you were to, uh, you know, ultraviolet light is basically coming from the intermediate mass stars. H alpha emission is ionizing radiation from the highest mass stars. If you look at the ratio between the UV light and the H alpha flux in these outside outer regions, um, you would say that there are more, or there are fewer very high mass stars than you would expect for a standard, uh, a near saltpeter IMF. This might be just saying, this might be talking about how you, um, if these are small, uh, small, uh, small star forming regions, maybe it just means it's more difficult to form very high mass stars in those regions. It might not be a change in the IMF. It might be some kind of cutoff introduced by the size of the star forming region. But this is certainly an interesting thing that, that uh, I know that there are one of the galaxies, I forget which one it is, um, there's a number of these ultraviolet knots have been identified and, and HST is going to uh, be observing them soon just to try and get some idea of what the mass function looks like. But this has been something that, that, has, that has come up recently. Um, yeah, so, yes, it says there, HST observations of UV knots in, and I never quite found what the, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and then the one other thing, the other uh, area that the, there's been uh, some suggestion for a change in the IMF is looking at elliptical galaxies. Um, the, so iron hydride bands are sensitive to gravity. Uh, they are strong in dwarfs, they are weak in giants. The basic argument here is that from looking at uh, a spectra of elliptical galaxies, uh, Stephen Conroy and Pete van Dockum have argued that the hydride bands are too strong for there to be giants there. They believe that the light from the elliptical stars is dwarf dominated. If it's dwarf dominated, then suddenly you're changing the mass function to steeper than saltpeter, because that's the only way that you can get dwarfs to dominate the light. Um, the, 
Typically, you, you would expect K-giants to dominate the light in elliptical galaxies, and there's something like a 10 magnitude difference between the, the, the giants and the dwarfs. So you have to get the appropriate increase in number of dwarfs. Um, why would this happen? Well, that's a big question. And I think maybe I'll go to the next slide and say that um, the IMF is always conventional when we can count stars. As soon as you become unable to count stars, it suddenly seems to become unconventional. Uh, and I would has I, well, I do believe that changing the IMF is something like the last resort of a scoundrel. Uh, so I think all of these results are interesting, but they certainly uh, you know why would an elliptical galaxy decide that within that environment it's suddenly going to form form lots more M dwarfs than uh, we do locally. Uh, and in fact, there's a really nice paper um, titled on why we need a good theory of star formation. This was by Donald Lyndon Bell in 1978. Uh, Donald being his usual perceptive self, he divides the mass function up into three areas. There's the uh, area one are the high mass stars that are basically giving you the yield and elements. Area two are the uh, long lived stars that give you the light. And area three are the brown dwarfs where you bury material and never see it again. Um, but Donald quoted something from uh, f uh, that uh, Dick McRae, uh, actually it wasn't Dick McRae, it was the other McRae, said, um, how does a massive gas over 100 solar masses know that it's too heavy to form a star? In a similar vein, I would like to ask, how does a massive gas in a very massive galaxy know the mass of the, ga know the, mass of the galaxy it is in? So how would material within an elliptical galaxy know that it had to form lots of low mass stars. You might stretch it even further and say that uh, elliptical galaxies form hierarchically, and how do these stars know where they would end up in? Right, that's even one more step. So <laughs> <laughs> it requires prescience at yet new levels. So, <laughs> so I mean, this, this, was, this actually came up because at, the same, at that time, Sandy Faber had some measurements of elliptical galaxies that seemed to indicate the same kind of effect. So if you like, this is just a warning that. Um, it's very easy to fix things by changing the IMF sometimes. That's something you should resist unless the, it's really overwhelming evidence because as I say everywhere, I mean, the, the paper by Bastien is really uh, a tour de force in going through and looking at where we can measure the IMF reliably, reliably and finding out that in fact in all those places it looks pretty much the same. So I think we know what the IMF looks like. I think we have no understanding as to how it gets that way, and that I think is where the, that's the real focus that we should be working on, is trying to figure out what's the physics that takes a, a, a cloud of gas and always turns it into this, uh, this form of uh, this distribution of mass for stars. So how can we test it further? Well, we have to look in extreme environments, I think. You really, if you really want to try and understand um, the IMF and, and whether it's, you, we would like to find somewhere where the IMF really is different. We like to try and understand why the IMF looks different in Taurus. I mean, is that something to do with the gas pressure? Is it something to do with the metallicity? It's probably not metallicity, but it might be gas pressure because Taurus is a, is a diffuse star forming environment. So the, that may be affecting uh, the cloud cores. Um, I'm not going to say Kathy's going to explain that later, but <laughs> Bob will. Um, so, <laughs> but that, that, I think this is, a, this is a ripe area for looking at in the future, really trying to, under, trying, trying to find somewhere where it really is different. Okay, let's get past that. Um, so multiplicity, um, very quickly, at least getting the basics. This is from Adam Burgas's paper, uh, 2007. Um, this is looking, this is taking the Dukena Mayor solar type uh, bi uh, binary fraction, we pull that down to 50% now. But there is this clear trend as you get down to lower masses that binary frequency decreases. And let me s uh, actually, so one thing to point out um, this scarcity of low mass or high Q systems for solar type stars, I'd argue that we knew about that beforehand. One thing about the solar type stars near the sun, they've been studied to death for planets, therefore, finding close in massive companions. That's been, for, for almost all of those stars, there's really high resolution radio velocity data that should have turned out any of those companions really quickly. If you take the stars within 25 parsecs and you plot up, this is separation logarithmic in AU, this is the mass of the companion, or actually, this, yes, this is the mass of the companion. 
uh, like I say, solar type stars. Within about 50 AU, there's a deficit of low mass objects. Now this has been known for, long, known for a long time as the brown dwarf desert. It's not a brown dwarf desert, it's also an M dwarf desert and maybe even a K dwarf desert. Um, solar type stars don't like to have M dwarfs, brown dwarfs or K dwarfs next to them. I think that's telling us something about the way they form. Um, that's, these, the plots on the right are just the, um, are the mass function of companions as a function of separation. So that's within 10 AU, 10 to 100 AU, and more than 100 AU. And the further out you go, the closer you come to the field star mass function. Uh, very low mass stars. We've got some really strong evidence that very low mass stars only, uh, um, and brown dwarfs only like to have companions that are about the same mass. This is separation in arc seconds. This is uh, relative magnitude. This is the point spread function from NICMOS and HST. Um, and this is, this is the brightness of companions that have been detected of brown dwarfs. We could, you can't see it there, but basically down round about here would correspond to a mass ratio, a Q of around about 0.2. There's a big discovery space in here where we could have found companions that had high mass, uh, mass ratios that we haven't. Every brown dwarf that's a binary has around about a, a companion of around about the same luminosity. And because brown dwarfs evolve with time, if it's the same luminosity, uh, then it's the same mass. So this is a really solid result. Um, that's um, at the very low mass end. And one other, I mean, there are wide systems, skip past this. Sorry, Madalena, no time. <laughs> but this is, this is the one other plot to think about. This is separation logarithmic in AU. This is large separation to small separation. This is the total mass of the system. And this is just, it's not a complete sample. It's just a, a, a whole lot of binaries that are known. But as you go down in total system mass, the maximum separation that you see decreases. Presumably this is something to do with binding energy. But as you get down to the very low mass brown dwarfs, there's basically nothing wider separation than about 10 or 15 AU. Um, uh, if there are brown dwarfs that are wide companions of other, of other objects, they're wide companions of main sequence stars. So in terms of the total mass of a the system, they're sitting up here. These two lines here, this is uh, what an M to the minus two relation, this is an exponential relation. And again, they're just kind of marking the boundaries. And just one, I think, final thing is to say that there are some wide low mass systems. This is actually plotting binding energy now against the total mass. These systems here are young. So wide systems can form in stellar, uh, in, in stellar environments, but they, they seem to get stripped. So that by the time you get into the field, you've lost, you, you preferentially lose the wider systems as you go down lower and lower in mass. And I think that was, do you have anything else to say? Yeah, right. So that's, yeah, the sun lives, lives in a quiet but representative neighborhood. Should be perfect for Switzerland. Um, especially the quiet bit. The uh, stellar IMF, I think we have, it's observation and well-defined. Theoretically, we don't know what's going on. And binary properties, I think we also understand pretty well, for, at least in the field. So the questions, what's the physics underlying binary formation? And then one question I've always had is, how do you count binaries properly in a mass function? I mean, is there a difference between a close binary and a wide binary? Um, I mean, how, what you want to do is to go from somewhere from what you're seeing in the field to the molecular cloud. So how do you trace that? For, um, for, uh, for, the, for the companions. And then, yeah, what's the physics underlying the IMF? I think that's, that's still one of the biggest questions that we need to answer. So, thank you. <laughs> and your shortened questions. <laughs> that's right. But maybe that's because I explained it all perfectly. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, see, I see things more as a continuum than as, um, as different boxes. 
Uh, because again, for I mean, why should a, why should a, why should the physics that forms stars and binaries know anything about the physics of hydrogen burning? I mean, that just doesn't really. I think if you step back, you know, go try and read anything that Lyndon Bell wrote, because in there there are, there are all these little little gems of of general uh, of general concepts that you need to think about, and how you connect things together in different areas is one of the one of the important things. So yeah, I, I would I would not really think that you would see a break. Um, well, yep. Did you have a question or no? Nope. Well, I thought there were more uh, white binaries, no mass white binaries discovered. I don't think all of them are, are young. I, I'm not. A, so, so there are a lot of white. Com, there are a lot of white low mass companions of solar type stars. In terms of a brown dwarf or an M dwarf M dwarf, I mean, there there are a lot of uh, also there are a lot of M dwarf M dwarf companions. Uh, one of the things that the Leuton proper motion catalog did was pick out a lot of these common proper motion objects. And there you're talking about things that are several thousand AU apart. So there you may, it, it's possible there you've actually got, they're, they're only very lightly bound gravitationally, maybe just they form together. Um, in terms of the very low mass objects, the only ones that I'm aware of are uh, associated with star forming regions or, or fairly members of like the TW Hydra Association. Um, but I will look up that and see if I can find out because it's possible I missed some stuff. Yeah, up that, uh, you said that uh, low mass uh, binaries have very uh, high mass ratios. Is, is that could be observational bias? Or no. No, I think that, that's actually the, this plot here is. Um, this is this is so. This is the point spread function from HST. Down all the way down to here, we could detect companions. Uh, and you don't see anything in this big discovery space here. So this, this, is, this is only, I mean, to give, to, uh, to give the appropriate caveat, this is only looking at things that are separated beyond about 3 AU. It's only doing direct imaging. Um, this is a, an example of the sort of the imaging that you do. But there was plenty of, we've looked now at something like 150 objects. And there's, the only binaries that we find are up there in roughly equal luminosity. There's a big discovery space where we haven't found anything. So I, I think this is a really strong evidence that, that um, you're, it's difficult. Low mass things, like to find, they like to have companions that are about the same. It's friends of friends or something, I don't know. Really yep. Question back here. Yep, sorry. So I missed that. So, um, oh. For example, can we, can we, uh, can you, can I, so I guess it's not quite universal because we know, know at least one place, Taurus, where it doesn't seem to work. But I would argue that within the statistical uncertainties, which are substantial, if you look at high mass, if you look at a cluster like R136, if you look at Orion, high density clusters, if you look at the Pleiades, if you look at the field, all of those, uh, the field within the immediate solar neighborhood, all of those have mass functions that are consistent with each other within the uncertainties, that there's no obvious systematic difference between them. And any systematic differences that come up between what you see, and particularly looking at clusters, uh, I mean, clusters, a lot of the, uh, it, certainly many clusters are deficient in low mass stars, but that's what you expect based on the dynamical evolution. So I, I don't think that there's any one place where you can unequivocally point to something, apart from Taurus, where you can point to something and say, this is definitely different. And, uh, and if we can find more places that are like Taurus, then I think we can start to get a much better handle on there. I, I will check. I'm not aware of that. I mean, I, I think Taurus has been searched pretty thoroughly. It's also for Taurus, it's uh, the deficit. Uh, no. 
is it's not just in the low mass. Where is it? Ah, there we go. Mm. Some of us yes. were holdouts, actually. Mm. And, and finally, I think uh, Louisa Rivol also added recently some new low mass stars, but from, from the Spitzer series, right. it's just not enough. Yeah, the, I mean, you're, you're, the thing is, this is, de this is decreasing all the way down here. Unless this is extremely new. Yeah. Um, that we're not familiar with. But I think Kevin was right, basically. Oh, this is new. Mm. Which is very ironic, given that it's one of the best studied star forming, if not the best right. studied star forming. Yes. Yeah, I didn't see the, the, the paper. I don't know if it's in the paper, but I remember the conference where they, they were saying that they, they finally found the missing. The, the, the oh, well, it's, that sounds like something for Google <laughs> or ADS. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll dig. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's true that there was some uh, discussion about this in, in Taurus. And in fact, they were saying that, in fact, Taurus doesn't really show any deficit of brown dwarf, but more an excess of K star. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It's it's. Do you just flatten that a bit, and it all fits in? Yes. But you know, if you look closely enough, you and I don't look alike. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. <Yeah. laughs>